The National Desk, America's News, now. Presidential face-off from migration, abortion, even their own mental fitness. The biggest moments of the Trump-Biden rematch and how the nation is reacting. Plus, making Bible lessons mandatory, the state now requiring schools to incorporate scripture in the classroom. And later, the American dream now out of reach, the saving struggle for millions and how it's impacting housing nationwide. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Didi Gatton. We're glad you're here with us. On this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week and we look ahead at what to expect, starting with the four big stories we've been following this week. Cause identified one over a year after the toxic train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, the NTSB now revealing what went wrong. The Dolly container ship leaves the port of Baltimore for Virginia. What comes next for the crew that was stuck on board? Severe weather from coast to coast, the extreme heat, flooding and wildfires impacting millions of Americans. Plus, decision day, the Supreme Court wrapping up its session for the summer. The key opinions the justices have released so far. President Biden's debate performance has some Democrats considering if he's fit for a second term as president. Here's national correspondent Matt Gelka in Atlanta. It was this moment near the beginning of the debate that set off alarm bells for Democrats. What I've been able to do with the uh, with, with, with the COVID, excuse me, with um, dealing with everything we have to do with, uh, look, if we finally beat Medicare. Biden didn't seem sharp with a raspy, soft voice and sometimes jumbled answers. Trump was able to go off unchecked and Biden seemingly couldn't keep up. The panicky headlines from multiple outlets came quick. Even close Biden allies were stunned. This was not the debate performance that the Biden campaign team wanted or needed from this debate. Look, there, there is no two ways about it. That was not a good debate for Joe Biden. Multiple New York Times opinion pieces called on Biden to drop out. Republicans also piled on. I feel like this is a national security risk for our country because what the world saw was weakness. A more fiery Biden showed up at a rally in North Carolina Friday and didn't speak like a candidate who will be stepping aside. I don't deb debate as well as I used to, but I know what I do know. I know how to tell the truth. I know how to get things done. And I know like millions of Americans know, when you get knocked down, you get back up. Biden told reporters after the debate it wasn't so bad. And not all Democrats were ready to abandon ship. Pennsylvania Senator John Fetterman compared it to his own poor debate performance against Dr. Mehmet Oz when Fetterman was briefly written off. He went on to win the election and tweeted bluntly, chill the F out. It's well documented that Biden spent days practicing for the debate at Camp David. His team also helped craft the rules and agreed to the format. It further calls into question how all of that prep led to that performance last night. For the National Desk in Atlanta, I'm Matt Gelkin. New details now. An overheated wheel bearing caused last year's toxic train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio. That's according to the National Transportation Safety Board, which laid out its findings and recommendations this week. They say a sensor about 20 miles from the crash in Salem, Ohio, failed to detect the overheated wheel bearing, which sparked a massive fire and caused the crash. NTSB investigators said even if it had, there's no standard response. They recommended establishing rules and creating a database to log failures. The data exists, but it doesn't exist uh, in one database. So you can find it on a car per car basis, but not as an industry wide uh, database. Officials also reiterated that Norfolk Southern's decision to burn the toxic vinyl chloride involved in the derailment was not necessary. At the time, Norfolk had said burning the chemicals was needed to prevent an explosion. The Dolly container ship arrived in Norfolk, Virginia from Baltimore this week, three months 
after crashing into the Francis Scott Key Bridge, killing six construction workers. Its containers are now being unloaded, then the ship will undergo repairs. Eight of the crew members from the cargo ship are being allowed to go back to their home countries. The ship lost power on March 26 and crashed into a bridge pier, causing the bridge to collapse. The National Transportation Safety Board and FBI are investigating. As wildfires continue to threaten the West Coast, a new study found the frequency and intensity of severe wildfires has more than doubled in the last two decades. That's according to the journal Nature Ecology and Evolution. Wildfires are considered extreme when they damage neighborhoods, ecosystems, and the climate. The problem is even more pronounced in the U.S. and Canada, where extreme fires have increased 11-fold in the last 20 years. Extreme heat is sending more Americans to the emergency room. The CDC reports hospitals in more than two dozen states report extremely high rates of heat-related emergencies. That includes in the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, Midwest, and Mountain West. Doctors say most cases are heat exhaustion. Heat kills more people in an average year than any other type of extreme weather. The Supreme Court issuing a temporary victory for abortion rights on Thursday, allowing emergency abortions in Idaho for now. The National Desk, Kayla Gaskins, details what this means for women nationwide. Doctors in Idaho will still be allowed to perform emergency abortions for now. The Supreme Court choosing not to make a decision in one of the closest watched cases this term, instead kicking it back down to the lower courts. The move leaves the central question unanswered, whether or not a federal law protecting emergency health care overrides the state's strict abortion bans in certain cases. Do we want doctors to be thinking in that moment, am I going to be prosecuted and weighing that as part of their decision in an emergency medical procedure? I think obviously the, the Biden administration administration and the folks who challenged this law would say no. The decision was posted prematurely Wednesday, the final opinion dropping Thursday morning. Justice Katanji Brown Jackson penning her own scathing dissent, writing, this is not a victory for pregnant patients, it's a delay. Sinclair Station KBOI spoke with Idaho State Senate Minority Leader Melissa Wintrow. We have the worst abortion bans in the country already, and those laws aren't going to change at all. Justice Amy Coney Barrett explained they opted for a dismissal because the shape of these cases has substantially shifted since they agreed to hear it earlier this year. Justice Samuel Alito argued the Supreme Court should have ruled on the case, writing, apparently the court has simply lost the will to decide the easy, but emotional and highly politicized question that the case presents. That is regrettable. This case only applies to Idaho and it doesn't answer key questions about emergency abortions elsewhere. The justices could take the case back up in the future. I'm Kayla Gaskins reporting for the National Desk, America's News Now. The Biden administration is lowering the cost of 64 prescription drugs that fall under Medicare through inflation penalties. The new program requires the drug makers to pay rebates to Medicare if they raise the price of the drug faster than the rate of inflation. According to health experts, more than 750,000 people with Medicare use these drugs that treat conditions like osteoporosis as well as cancer. Another Federal Reserve official is dashing expectations of an interest rate cut. Federal Reserve Governor Michelle Bowman says the time is not right. In a speech this week, Bowman said she still needs more evidence. Price increases are coming down towards the Fed's 2% target rate. Her comments are similar to what Fed Chief Jerome Powell said earlier this month. So far this year, the data have not given us that greater confidence. The most recent inflation readings have been more favorable than earlier in the year, however, and there has been modest further progress toward our inflation objective. May's readings from the Fed's preferred gauge shows inflation running just under 3%, a nudge lower than in April. Even so, Bowman says she still expects rates to hold steady at five and a quarter. The economy is on voters' minds across the country. Janae Bowens with the Fact Check team is here to talk finances, and many will tell you, Janae, that it is really tough to save right now. Yeah, Didi, so more than half of Americans are uncomfortable with their level of emergency savings. 27% of adults have no emergency savings at all, and I found this data in a new report from Bankrate. What would Americans need to feel comfortable with their finances? Yeah, so 89% of Americans say they need at least three months of expenses saved to feel comfortable, but only 44 
4% have at least three, three months of expenses saved, and even less have at least six months of expenses saved. Of course, this will vary from person to person, yeah. but from the research that you looked at, what's preventing Americans from saving? Well, 63% of adults say inflation is causing them to save less for unexpected expenses. Didi, they also say rising interest rates are a big issue. And speaking of high interest rates, Janae will be back in just a few minutes to discuss the prices of homes and mortgage rates. Developing now, Oklahoma's top education official is ordering public schools to incorporate the Bible and the Ten Commandments into lessons for grades five through high school. State Superintendent Ryan Walters, who is a Republican, warned that the mandate is immediate and strict compliance is expected. This follows a key ruling from the state Supreme Court this week. Justices blocked an attempt to create the nation's first publicly funded religious charter school in Oklahoma. Meantime, civil liberties groups are working to block the new Louisiana law that requires the Ten Commandments be displayed in every public school classroom. The ACLU, in conjunction with other civil rights groups, filed a lawsuit Monday. The groups claim the law violates the First Amendment by imposing religious beliefs on school children. The law in Louisiana says classrooms must put up a poster sized display of the Ten Commandments by the start of next year. That goes for public K through 12 schools as well as state funded universities. Up next on the National Desk, a string of recent hacks targeting American businesses. A cybersecurity expert explains what these groups might be looking to gain. Plus, closing the gap, the state trying to expand access and reduce costs of popular weight loss drugs. Apple has announced a partnership with ChatGPT maker OpenAI. The deal allows millions of Apple users to access technology from OpenAI. Joining Jan Jeffcoat to discuss is cybersecurity and privacy attorney Lisa Garber. Apple and OpenAI announced this deal that will install essentially ChatGPT in its operating systems uh, and Siri. Now, this will impact more than 2 billion active devices worldwide. So tell us more about the deal and what are the AI safety and security concerns here? Apple seemed late to the party in terms of starting to partner on artificial intelligence, and Apple is calling it Apple Intelligence, still AI, but their partnership with OpenAI is an intriguing choice and troublesome for privacy and security experts and also for consumers that love Apple devices. Apple has always said security and privacy are a human right. And OpenAI has struggled with security and privacy. They've faced issues with regulators. They've, they've faced issues with websites for scraping data to train their large language models. Really, there's no way around the use of AI in new Apple devices. It will be part of automatic operating system updates. So that's a concern for consumers. And speaking of a concern for consumers right now, debt collection enterprise financial business and consumer solutions did suffer this massive data breach that affected millions of Americans. Uh, the data breach leaked sensitive information, including social security numbers we're hearing right now. Lisa, how did this happen and what should you do if you are a victim? Unfortunately, these types of data breaches have become run of the mill around the world. This debt collection agency handled a wide range of debts, student loans, car loans, all of this type of information impacts so many different kinds of Americans. And part of the concern was this breach happened February 14th, Valentine's Day. It wasn't uncovered until two months, two weeks later. Consumers weren't notified until three months later. Mm. The debt collection agency is offering up to two years of identity theft protection. But the problem is our information is already floating around out there. And this is true of so many data breaches. Why was it hacked? Who knows? It's either money or power. Those are the concerns, right? Or notoriety in terms of power. What we have to do is be hyper aware. It's just part of cyber healthcare now. You put a freeze on your credit 
uh, you put a freeze on your credit, you constantly check your financial status, you can opt in to pay for memberships with different cybersecurity companies that will do searches of where your information is hiding out on the dark net too. We just have to be vigilant since now we are constantly using internet connected devices. It's just how we have to live our lives now. I like what you called it, cyber healthcare, part of the whole cyber healthcare plan that we all have to be uh, vigilant uh, of. Adding to the string of recent hacks on American businesses, there was a cyber attack that disabled software systems of nearly 15,000 car dealerships. In fact, we've been talking about it all morning here uh, on the national desk, and that's because software provider CDK Global says its systems were hacked and that, quite frankly, a lot of these systems aren't going to be online before Sunday. So tell us more about this breach and what happened here because it affected, as I said, 15,000 car dealerships. This is a fascinating one because you hear CDK, you don't think that's a car dealership and it's not. It's software as a service that, as you said, thousands of car dealerships use across the country. And I heard about this because friends were buying cars and processes just completely stopped. They went to pen and paper, things got very frustrating. You can imagine multiple visits to the DMV and that's how their days were going. This has been pinned to an Eastern European cyber crime syndicate. And again, reasons why they do it, money and power. They are likely negotiating millions of dollars in a payout from CDK. This is related to a ransomware attack, which means the cybercrime syndicate stopped data functioning on all of their computers, all of their servers, and said, pay us a certain amount, we'll give you access back. So they're likely negotiating this. This is what Bloomberg has reported, others have reported hearing about. So we probably won't know final details for some time, but it's fascinating because everyone is a target, right? This is just a software as a service provider, but it so happens they impacted thousands of car dealerships. Yeah. And very quickly, software service provider, you would think they'd have uh, protection uh, with protections, further protections. You know, you how are these happening so easily, it seems like? No one's perfect, right? And you really just need to be the most secure on the block. But the problem is ransomware especially, which has been one of the hottest types of cyber threats, can hit anybody. And all you need is one vulnerable point of entry. The weakest link can just be one person who makes a mistake. And that's the problem. Yeah. All right, cybersecurity expert and privacy attorney, Lisa Garber. We appreciate you joining us this morning. Hope you have a great weekend. You too, thank you. Thank you. Popular weight loss drugs like Wagovi are moving from celebrity circles to everyday Americans, but the price is still out of reach. The National Desk Angela Brown digs into the medical coverage battle. Now, many of the medications uh, for weight loss on the market today are GLP-1 agonists. Plenty of patients are coming to Dr. Jen Cottle for weight loss drugs like Wagovi. For the right person, these medications are not bad. Weight loss medications, never more popular. The landscape to navigate costs, never messier. And I'm finding that insurance companies are not always covering them. People, even if they're covered, I'm sending people to multiple pharmacies to see if they're in stock. A battle brewing over medical coverage, both private and state. Colorado introducing a bill to require insurers to cover weight loss medications. Right now, a total of 16 state Medicaid programs cover weight loss drugs. While recently, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan is pulling back on coverage of various weight loss drugs due to rising costs for those medications. Do you think more health insurance companies should cover this? Yes, health insurance companies should be covering these medications. And we need to figure out drug shortage issues, not just for these, but also for ADHD medications and all the other medications that are on drug shortages right now. But the cost to cover those drugs? Expensive. Take North Carolina. This year, dropping coverage for weight loss medications for government workers. Last year, the state paid over $100 million for those medications like Wagovi. Healthinsurance.org puts the price range for the most common weight loss drugs and more than $900 a month to more than $1,300 a month. In Washington, D.C., I'm Angela Brown. Up next here on the National Desk, Columbus, Ohio, taking action to curb crime. The community members walking the streets this weekend to raise awareness. Plus, caring for family members with Alzheimer's. Their free program in Florida helping track those patients who may go missing.
National Desk team of reporters is bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America. And we start in Ohio, where just days after a violent mass shooting, local leaders are joining together to deter crime in the community. A quiet Monday afternoon in the short north. But less than 48 hours ago, crime tape blocked off this area. Pastor Eddie Parker and Jacob Gauss, manager of Goody Boy, decided something needs to be done after Sunday's mass shooting. A lot of these crimes are committed by young people. And I think that the community needs to take the initiative. There's a community that lives behind us, a community that lives across the street from us. Columbus is growing daily. You know, you just want to see everybody go home at the end of the night, whether it's a friend, whether it's a stranger. You don't want to see nothing happen to anybody down there. So Parker, Gauss, and other community members will be walking the short north overnight, Friday into Saturday, giving out sunglasses and crime prevention materials. Because we care. Because we care about them, and we want them to know that we care. Safety officials in South Carolina are informing beachgoers about the dangers of heat and dehydration. Heat illness is not always easy to detect, but there are some signs experts want you to be aware of. If you start to feel that you're a little woozy or you've been sweating all day and now you're not, that's usually a sign that you're starting to get in that, that bad realm of that heat illness. Make sure you're drinking that water ahead of time. You want to get kind of pregame a little bit with that. According to the CDC, approximately 1,220 people in the United States are killed by extreme heat every year. In Florida, more than half a million people 65 and older are living with Alzheimer's disease. This can lead to stress on caregivers and family members when a loved one with memory issues wanders off. A Florida-based nonprofit is now giving away tracking bracelets to help families keep track of loved ones. We really want for people to take advantage of this free opportunity because we don't want a family to have a loved one wander and then really realize that this is something they should have done. Law enforcement are able to track the bracelets using a specific frequency. The program is free for any family to sign up. Still ahead, suing NASA. A piece of space junk crashes through the air, damaging a family's home, where NASA says it came from. The COVID-19 summer wave is here, and according to the CDC, cases are now rising in at least 39 states. While COVID hospitalizations are up by 25% in May, this wave does seem to be milder. An increase in deaths and ER visits driven by multiple variants has been reported. The CDC no longer tracks COVID cases, but it estimates transmission based on emergency department visits. Taking a look at the top trending stories on our website right now. A park in Illinois is closed. Look right here after a massive sinkhole opened up in the middle of a soccer field. Local media reporting the 100 foot sinkhole was part of an underground mining collapse. 90 animals seized in Ohio now have hope of a better future. Following a tip, police rescued 81 birds and rabbits along with nine dogs from a prop property in Delaware County. U.S. middle and high school students are giving their schools a B-minus grade for the second year in a row. 
Students cited a lack of excitement for learning and poor college and career readiness. Those stories and more available right now at thenationaldesk.com. Three of the largest record companies in the U.S. are now suing two AI startups alleging copyright infringement. Sony, Universal and Warner Music Group claim that Suno and Udio used unlicensed sound recordings in popular artists' work to train their AI systems to produce copyrighted music. The lawsuit also claims some of the digital music files are now on major streaming services. A Florida family is suing NASA after a piece of space debris crashed into their home in March. NASA confirms that the object was hardware from the International Space Station, adding that it should have burned up upon re-entry. The family is reportedly seeking $80,000 for the damages as well as mental and emotional distress. NASA has six months to respond to the lawsuit. Ahead in our next half hour, historic indictment. The officers now facing charges in the failed police response to the Uvalde mass shooting. Plus, alarming alliance, Washington's warning over Russia and North Korea's deepening relationship and the new alliance between the two countries. You're watching the National Desk, America's News Now. You can catch us live weekdays from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time and anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We'll be right back. The National Desk, America's News, now. Six in ten Americans are worried about a loved one being shot. Half of our kids are worried about a shooting in their school. Public health crisis declared the Surgeon General's plea for reform as firearm violence is now the leading cause of death in children. 400 migrants brought to the U.S. by smugglers affiliated with ISIS, the dozens who have yet to be caught and questioned. And later, housing price spike. Homeowners and renters both burdened by climbing costs. The part of their finances suffering as a result. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Didi Gatton, and developing two former Uvalde school police officers have been indicted in the failed response to the 2022 mass shooting at Robb Elementary School. Former school district police chief Pete Arredondo and officer Adrian Gonzalez, who are facing felony charges of abandoning and endangering children. They are the first to face criminal charges in one of the deadliest school shootings in U.S history. The U.S. Surgeon General just declared gun violence a public health crisis as the number of deaths and injuries involving firearms continues to grow nationwide. The National Desk, Jeff Harris, explains what the Surgeon General hopes will happen with this new declaration in place. With this declaration, U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murthy is calling for sweeping changes across the country when it comes to gun ownership. For example, bans on automatic rifles, universal background checks, and penalties for those who fail to store guns safely. A professor of forensic studies at Florida Gulf Coast and former law enforcement, David Thomas tells us this declaration was a long time coming. It, it's a problem that needs to be addressed. 
Declaring something as a public health crisis means that it poses a substantial risk to humans, potentially causing a significant number of fatalities. Thomas says gun violence fits that description. We have kids that are murdering kids on a daily basis, and, and that needs to be addressed. But spokesperson for the National Police Association, Betsy Brantner Smith, tells us she believes this declaration is a little too broad. Really, we'd like to see the Surgeon General break out um, gun violence in a little more specific terms. For example, talking about the prosecution of violent crime. If we do not punish aberrant behavior, if we do not punish violent crime, it will continue to occur. And addressing mental health issues. We just have so many people that have so many mental health issues. And again, we're not talking about how to help them. Now, along with new regulations, Murphy is also calling for an increase in gun violence research, also for health systems to promote and educate patients about gun safety and proper storage during visits. I'm Jeff Harris reporting from Washington. At the U.S.-Mexico border, the Department of Homeland Security says arrests for illegal border crossings have dropped more than 40 percent since asylum processing was suspended three weeks ago. According to DHS, Border Patrol's average daily arrests over a seven-day period dropped below 2,400. That's still above the 1,500 mark needed to resume asylum processing. However, the department says daily arrests are at the lowest number since just before the president took office. Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas is dispelling reports that his department has identified 400 migrants brought to the U.S. by an ISIS-affiliated human smuggling network. He told reporters DHS has not identified 400 people with potential ties to ISIS. This all comes after concerns grew when eight Tajikistan nationals with potential ties to terrorism were arrested after entering the U.S.-Mexico border earlier this month. Every single year we encounter individuals that do indeed pose a threat uh, to our public safety. That is not something unique to this administration. He says those in custody are in the process of being deported. According to the report, many of the 400 migrants crossed the border and were reportedly released because they were not on the government's terror watch list. Intelligence officials warn of the growing alliance between North Korea dictator Kim Jong-un and Russian President Vladimir Putin. Joining Jan Jeffcoat to discuss is attorney and author of China is Going to War, Gordon Chang. What did you make of this mutual defense pact between Putin and Kim Jong-un, especially the timing of it after Putin left Beijing and his meeting with Xi Jinping? Pretty uh, empty-handed. Yes, well, Putin met with Xi Jinping early before he met with uh, Kim Jong-un. And I think that indicates that with regard to North Korea and Russia, they couldn't come to their comprehensive strategic partnership agreement, and they certainly couldn't come to their mutual defense pact without Beijing's approval. You know, we know that the North Koreans don't like the Chinese. That's uh, hatred that goes back hundreds of years. But North Korea is crit critically reliant on Beijing. And when China wants something important, they get it. And the North Koreans don't do anything important without first consulting and getting the approval of Xi Jinping. Now, experts have noted, Gordon, that the language in this pact and, and a previous mutual defense pact from 1961 between uh, the then Soviet Union and North Korea uh, it was very similar. That pact, as we know, never put to the test. How could this move, though, destabilize the Korean Peninsula and have a global impact really around the world? Yeah, I think the big impact of this is that it shows to the rest of the world that the world has indeed divided into camps. And in one of those camps includes North Korea, Russia, China, Iran, and a few other countries, perhaps Algeria. And, and that really means that we're in a very, very different situation. And we've got to understand that uh, the United States, its friends and partners, are now in a Cold War type situation. Um, we can't deal with these militant states from a, a standpoint of trying to obtain cooperation. I think we have to understand the reality of it and believe that this is a global struggle. And this struggle, unfortunately, is existential. I saw what you wrote on X, that the lessons of 1938 are clear, agreeing with the idea that standing up in unity to the aggressor is how world wars are prevented. 
Talk about this, Gordon, in terms of what we're seeing today with the foreign policy of this current administration. Well, the Biden administration um, says things that sound good to the ear, like we should try to manage competition. The Chinese aren't adversaries. But unfortunately, the Chinese are adversaries. They've declared a people's war in the United States. The Chinese believe that that means total war. Um, and they are doing things which are completely unacceptable, including standing behind the fentanyl trade, stealing intellectual property in the hundreds of billions of dollars. You can't cooperate with a militant regime that's seeking your destruction. And that's unfortunate, but we are going to have to take some dangerous steps to confront this growing axis. And, and people will say, well, you know, we can't do dangerous things. Well, everything going forward, Jan, is dangerous. So that's no longer a meaningful objection. We've got to change our policies. We got to stop doing the things that have created this dangerous situation in the first place. You can view the full interview plus more top stories online all the time at thenationaldesk.com. 59% of Americans are uncomfortable with their level of emergency savings, according to new data from Bankrate. I'm back with Janae Bowens from the Fact Check team. Uh, Janae, as Americans grapple with discomfort over their savings, prices of homes are rising. Exactly, Didi. And so I got my hands on the newest report from S&P. In April, home prices increased by 6.3%. That's a new high record. I found numbers from the National Association of Realtors, too, showing homes were on average 407, 600 thousand dollars in April. For May, the price reached a record high of over $419,000. Oh, wow. And how many people are buying homes? Yeah, so not as many. That report I found from the National Associ Association of Realtors shows a drop in home sales of 0.7% from April to May and down from almost 2.8% since last year. Experts say the high prices of homes are at least partially to blame for the drop. Mortgage rates may play a role as well. Where are yeah. they currently? Right, so according to Freddie Mac, mortgage rates are at 6.86%. Now that's much lower than the high we saw in October 2022 at 8%. But Didi, it's still high for many Americans who are having a hard time saving for emergencies. No doubt about that. Janae, thank you. And for more on this Factory Team topic, including links to their sources, scan the QR code on your screen or visit thenationaldesk.com. Homeowners in America aren't the only ones struggling with an unaffordable housing market. Renters have become increasingly burdened by climbing housing costs. A Harvard University Joint Center for Housing Studies report reveals nearly one in four households that own a home are now stretched worryingly thin. And the cost burdens are even worse for renters. The report found renters who spend more than half of their income on housing and utilities rose in 2022 to a record high of more than 12 million people. Still to come, our team of correspondents breaks down this week in Washington from the CNN presidential debate to the key Supreme Court cases yet to be decided. And welcome back. Our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital every day, and our team of national correspondents report on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. The first presidential debate took place Thursday, and for those who predicted it would be a game changer, well, an old tip of the hat to you. National correspondent Matt Galka was there. Democrats not feeling very good after President Biden's performance, are they? No, I, th I think the word that's been used the most has been panic uh, uh, setting in among uh, a lot of Democrats and supporters of President Joe Biden. Uh, look, it, it, if you have eyes and ears and you watch the debate, it's hard to spin the first 20 minutes any other way than brutal for the president. He stumbled. He had a raspy voice. Uh, he didn't come across authoritative, especially as the narrative about his age and whether or not He's mentally fit to serve another term in the White House, has continued to dog him. And he just did not come out uh, with a fire or with, uh, again, a, 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 an authoritativeness that, that, that would put any of those narratives to bed. It was just a, a very brutal uh, beginning to the debate. It got a little better in the middle, but uh, Donald Trump basically went unchecked. It didn't seem like uh, uh, Joe Biden could keep up with him and, and get to his talking points during the debate. He had some moments in the middle, but it was also a poor finish. So in the day and age we live in uh, on the Internet with memes, with, with videos being clipped and, and just the pure optics of this, 
it, it did not look good for him. It did not feel good for Democrats. And the headlines were numerous coming out of the debate, it, openly calling for the president to possibly step aside, drop out, get another candidate in there, because that's how fearful Democrats are right now of losing the election. But it, it's not all Democrats. Some of them are saying, look, now it's not the time to abandon ship. Notably, uh, California Governor Gavin Newsom, who, who some say could be the candidate who would step in if uh, Joe Biden were to step aside. He said he, it's not the time to abandon ship. He's going to uh, support the president. He's going to continue to do that. So it's not all Democrats, but there certainly are enough right now that are not thrilled with how it went, that are worried about how it went, and and maybe waiting and seeing how this plays out in the polls is not the right move either because – we are not that far away from this election, and there's not a lot of time to get things figured out. So if there was – if the debate was meant to um, calm people down, it certainly had the opposite effect. Well, we'll start to see some of those polls in the coming days, and we'll see what the reaction is. And a reminder, the Democratic Convention, where they will be nominating Joe Biden, if he's still the, can the nominee or the candidate, is in about six weeks. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court just about to wrap up its term, and on Friday they released a key decision that could impact some of those that have been charged with crimes uh, regarding the January 6th riot, uh, and even President Trump, former President Trump. National correspondent Kayla Gaskins, tell us about that. Well, Steve, this is one of those Supreme Court decisions that we've been waiting all term uh, to see how the justices were going to rule. And on Friday, we finally got that answer. The Supreme Court ruling that the Justice Department did, in fact, overstep by charging hundreds of rioters on January 6th with obstruction. Now, this decision could force prosecutors to reopen some of the cases of the people that have already been charged, some of them behind bars. This decision did raise the threshold. A SCOTUS ruling that prosecutors, though, can charge the rioters with obstruction if they can prove that the rioters were in fact attempting to stop the certification of the election results. Not just that they were trying to force their way into the Capitol building on January 6th. So a little bit of a higher threshold there for prosecutors. Joseph Fisher, he was the guy at the center of this case. He, along with hundreds of other people, were charged with obstruction of official proceedings. Uh, prosecutors saying that they were trying to stop the certification, the election certification results that day. It was kind of interesting how justices rule, Steve, because we never quite know. You have the conservatives and the liberals, and they don't always line up with each other. This was a 6-3 decision, but we saw Katanji Brown-Jackson actually voting with the conservatives on this one, and Justice Amy Coney Barrett filing a dissent with the liberal justices, Sonia Sotomayor and Elena Kagan. Now, 52 defendants were charged with obstruction, were charged with only obstruction. Again, some of those have been sentenced, and some are in jail. These, will, these cases will likely reopen uh, these defendants will likely try to see if they can get those charges and those convictions reversed. But we are still waiting on one more big January 6th case. That is the immunity case for President Trump. And if presidents do have that immunity in relation to his charges for January 6th. But Steve, more decisions are expected to come down next week. And I'll get to Atra on the immunity thing in a second, but also worth pointing out that President Trump's the recipient of two of those obstruction charges in one of his federal cases. We'll see how the Supreme Court decision affects that case. Uh, and, and again, as you said, we're expecting the possibly the biggest decision of the Supreme Court term to come out on Monday, whether a president can be prosecuted for, quote, official acts during their time in office. National correspondent Atra Elnishaw, talk to us a bit about the potential ramifications about that one for the upcoming election, especially for former President Trump. Yes, Steve, as is typical for the Supreme Court, they're saving the most anticipated decision for, for the very end. So this is all about uh, special counsel Jack Smith's case against former President Trump for allegedly uh, trying to subvert uh, the results of the 2020 election, overturn it. Uh, and, and Trump here is arguing that he, because he was president at the time, he should have total immunity from any prosecution uh, from anything that he did while he was in office. This argument, uh, failed uh, dismally in lower courts. Uh, and during arguments that we now get to hear live streamed, uh, we hear the audio of the oral arguments, that the justices also seem skeptical, but it is a majority conservative court. So there's there's really no telling what they could decide. Uh, of course, Jack Smith and the administration's argument uh, is that not everything a president does is immune from prosecution once they leave office. Presidents for as long as this nation's been around have known that. Uh, so. However the justices decide could impact presidents 
forever. Samuel Alito, Justice Alito said that himself. Uh, they could side with Smith, they could side with Trump, or they could they could determine certain uh, presidential actions that are or are not uh, immune from prosecution once that president leaves office. But let's talk about the timing because that's just as important, arguably, as the actual decision. We know that Trump's legal strategy across cases has been delay, 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 and the fact that the Supreme Court has taken this long is a win in and of itself, especially if the court sends it back to the lower courts to decide the ultimate outcome. That's just more more time eaten up for this case uh, and getting us closer to the election because, of course, we know if former President Trump is elected again, he would use his Department of Justice to dismiss this case against him. Such a huge few days in, in uh, 2024 presidential campaign. We'll have to keep watching all of that. Atra, Kayla, Matt, thank you all for your hard work. Back to you. Up next on the National Desk, counting commute times. The return to the office and putting more cars on the road during rush hour. How much time drivers are wasting stuck in traffic? Plus, dealerships in danger, a massive cyber attack, making car sales nearly impossible, forcing some dealerships to close their doors. This is the National Desk America's News. Now, we have reporters all across the country in your neighborhoods covering issues that matter to you. From a North Carolina city increasing utility rates due to inflation to Florida car dealerships hit by a cyber attack, we're taking the pulse of America. But we start in Seattle where a new report reveals just how much time drivers are wasting in traffic. When sitting in traffic like this, what we really want to know is how much time we're wasting. 58 hours every year, according to Inrix. That's terrible. That's a lot of time. Honestly, I feel like there that's that could be time to be more active, to go outside, to spend time with family. Wasting the equivalent of one and a half work weeks in the car every year equates to more than $1,000 in lost productivity. So as a whole, the city of Seattle lost $1.6 billion in productivity and lost time in 2023. It seems more drivers are seeking alternatives. The latest data from King County Metro Transit shows ridership up from 22 to 23. Van pools up 48%, the sounder up 43%, and buses up 18%. It's gonna be like this for a long time, I think, so. Newburn Board of Aldermen members say providing reliable electricity while handling inflation isn't sustainable. That's why they're looking at an electric rate increase. I don't like it. But like I said, sometimes the increases are necessary. But Wayne Litton isn't happy about potentially paying an additional. Up to 6%. After already paying. 175 to $200 a month. We are at a point right now where the utility is operating at a deficit. Board members say they want more data before committing to the plan. So they voted to. The board did approve um, a 6% increase for the upcoming year only, not any additional increase beyond that. This is the first for us, so this is this is uncharted territory. We are completely dead in the water. Some car dealerships are wrestling with a cyber attack involving CDK, a company whose software is used by thousands of car dealerships. We just took the, the hard choice of, of deciding to just shut down at this point because it's just, it's too hard. Some car dealerships in our area are having to complete the paperwork the old fashioned way with pen and paper because they're unable to use the computer software that they need for titles, insurance, and sales contracts. One of the salespeople mentioned that there was a hack with the system and that we would have to do it the old way, which was a lot of paperwork. One expert says chances are the people who hacked into CDK are in a foreign country somewhere and they will demand a ransom. The uh, attackers are after a big payday, and so they go after uh, critical systems like this. 
still ahead, record-setting travel expected this 4th of July holiday. The best times to hit the road, according to AAA. With Independence Day approaching, AAA is predicting the busiest 4th of July travel rush ever. A little more than 70 million travelers are expected to hit the road going 50 miles or more from home from this weekend until next weekend. That's a 5% increase from 2023. AAA says the worst times to drive will be between 2 and 7 p.m. with the most traffic delays expected July 3rd and July 7th. The number of people flying is also expected to set a new record. Sam, the Bald Eagle, said goodbye to Reds fans at Great American Ballpark this week after more than 20 years of flying across the field during the national anthem. Sam has had a longer career than any Reds player, making his first appearance in 2004. He was originally found in the wild when he was only a few months old in 1999 and was taken to the Cincinnati Zoo. He suffered from extreme wing damage and couldn't fly, but he was able to soar. After some intense training, he landed in the big leagues. On Tuesday, he was honored at the pitcher's mound after his trainer noticed something wasn't right during a practice flight. He came out no problem, and then he just wouldn't lock in, and he just like flew over my head and just landed. And we thought, oh, that was weird. Let's load him up and try it again. And then he did the same thing, and I thought, there, I think there's something medically going on here. And sure enough, when we got back, it was very obvious he's got the, the two cataracts in both eyes. Something people look forward to. Sam will continue to do shows at the Cincinnati Zoo. The Reds are looking for his replacement in hopes to keep the tradition alive. But the zoo says it could take years before they find another bald eagle. That'll be all for us on the weekend edition of the National Desk America's News. Now, don't forget, you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time. Check your local listings. You can also watch us online and catch up with the latest headlines on thenationaldesk.com. Thanks for watching the weekend edition of The National Desk. I'm Didi Gatton, and from all of us here, have a great week.